supporting each other. Miss Rita Haney sent a card to the church that says, for the food, prayers, uh, y'all send up for our behalf. Thank you. And those who uh, made it possible for us to use the church uh, for Rex's funeral, thank you, everyone. Love. Rita Haney. Let me just tell you once again, guys, thank you for being the church. Uh, we talked about this uh, last Sunday night, a ministry of encouragement to each other. We talked about it this Wednesday night, bearing each other's burdens. And so it's a call, it's a ministry that the church has. And I'm so thankful for you guys and for all of your help. All righty, let's stand. We're going to sing tonight. Uh, let's go ahead and look to the screen. Some older songs I think you know. Let's sing them. Through my disappointment, strife and gets good to me. Day and glad that you uh, made the effort to come back out tonight to the service and I can assure you uh, the Lord will bless tonight as we are gathering in just a few moments we're going to look into the book of uh, 1 Corinthians and then uh, have a special time of prayer uh, for our national convention. I'm, I'm excited. I, I, I think I sound like some kind of salesman <laughs> when I keep talking about the national convention over and over again and you know what i'm willing to risk sounding like that because i really want there to be a strong emphasis upon prayer uh, for our national convention and the opportunity to attend uh, very rarely uh, 
that we have it this close. And so uh, it's even easier now. If you've been uh, up 22, take 65 south just a little bit and get off right there at the downtown exit. You really don't even have to get up, uh, go on 20 anymore. You can just kind of get off before uh, that old uh, exit. And man, it's just so easy to get in and out of. And don't let any kind of inconvenience keep you, right? People have said, well, I just don't like Birmingham. I just don't feel safe. I'm, I'm telling you, the city has went through an incredible amount of effort uh, to make the area improve it over the years. I've been down there lately, they have so vastly improved uh, that area around the city center, and it's just a bustling, happening place. So, uh, listen, you can go. You can say, you can go. It's a regular great process. Uh, it's very easy. It is taking a few minutes to come in here. I love it for so much time. I hope that that great training here is very close to the entrance of the main worship area. Uh, but listen, whatever reference you have to make, uh, make it and get there. And let's just see what God does. I'm so very excited for our pricing uh, this afternoon. They were on a Zoom new terms in the last two or three years, right? A Zoom meeting. In just a little while, toward the end of the service, we're going to close uh, with a special time of prayer uh, for the nationals. All righty, very good. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Speaking of prayer, and let's ask Him to bless our offering now, asking Him to bless as we give. Uh, let's give with generosity and let's give with a cheerful heart. Father, Lord, it is our privilege, privilege uh, to trust you with our finances. Uh, Lord, uh, you've asked us to. Uh, be those who give back to the kingdom work. And it's not that you need our money, it's you need our heart. Uh, Lord, um, the kingdom work is one in which you are fully capable, uh, Lord, of funding. But what you desire from us is a sense of lordship, Lord, that we will uh, give over to you our finances, Lord. And that means uh, giving a portion as you have asked us to give to the kingdom work. And Lord, Help us to be uh, reminded of the blessings, the blessings of giving, Lord, the opportunity, the privilege to worship you through our giving. And so, Lord, tonight, uh, bless our time of offering. Lord, I pray may it be used to the building of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Grab your copy of God's Word, and I hope you come with a heart ready to receive the Word again tonight. And what a privilege it is, I'll just say again, to be able to preach and teach God's Word. The first place I'd like for you to go to is 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Once you've got your place in 2 Corinthians 10, I want you to flip over uh, to 1 Corinthians 16. There's a typo there, 1 Corinthians 16, not 6, 8, but 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 16. 2 Corinthians 10, and then 1 Corinthians 16. I 
one of the most unique times of sharing the gospel for me was not in a regular church service. It wasn't as a youth camp. It wasn't in a revival service. One of the most unique and even powerful opportunities that I ever had in sharing the gospel, believe it or not, was at a funeral. And I know that sounds morbid. Uh, that sounds very odd. But let me tell you the context, and I think you will uh, understand a little bit better. When we were on the mission field, there was a, a lady that had got gloriously saved. I'm telling you, she got the gospel, uh, and she really turned her life around. She gave herself completely to the Lord, and that is not a unique story. But what is unique about her story is that from which she turned from. There's not many people that I know that say that they had worshipped Hinduism for all of their life, worshipped in the false religion Hinduism, and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But this lady did. And when she did, she did so uh, to the rejection of her family because her family said, you know, this is what we grew up as. This is what we believe. And if you choose to be a Christian, we will reject you. And they did. As she passed away on her home island of Trinidad, and it was my privilege to board a plane in the Virgin Islands in St. Croix. I had to travel over to Puerto Rico, oddly enough, travel west uh, 99 miles, and then uh, travel uh, southeast down to Trinidad and Tobago, landed in the port of Spain, drove down to a little community called Mayaro on the very southern tip of Trinidad and there I was with the family for two days and in those two days I learned some incredible things about that culture and in particular this family. I'll never forget I was on the streets of Mayaro and uh, I am six foot whatever and I weigh a lot of whatever so you get the point and I'm standing there on the street in the marketplace and I find it quite odd because cars were driving through and they would stop and point at me. And I thought, this is awkward. Why are they pointing at me? You get paranoid, Marilyn. You're thinking, what's going on? I asked our gracious host, uh, my gracious host, what was going on. And they said they very rarely see white men this far down south in Trinidad. And I thought, well, it was just because I was fat. But thank goodness. It was an interesting time. I remember before the funeral, I was uh, praying and asking the Lord to give me the words that I needed to say. And I began to talk to the family to help me understand the context of what it would be like. And they said, well, the funeral is not going to be at a funeral home. We're going to have it at the house place. And after we have the funeral, we're going over to an outdoor crematorium. And what that means is that they were actually going to cremate the body on an open fire pit. One day I'll give you more details but not now. But the point that I'm trying to make now is the time of the funeral was quite extraordinary because they wanted to honor her, her family, her friends, people in the community, but they despised the fact that it was a Christian funeral. I remember telling the host family, the uh, daughter of the lady who had passed, I said, you know what, I feel very, very strongly that in spite of these circumstances, in spite of knowing that most of the people that will be here will be Hindu, that I am going to concentrate upon the gospel. And she said, please do. I'll never forget the sense of tension. I felt it, Brother Donnie. I felt the sense of spiritual warfare. I remember standing up and I was looking out over the crowd of about 45 to 50 people. As I uh, presented the gospel, I saw them shaking their heads in disapproval. I saw uh, faces begin to snarl at me. And I, and I felt like though that passage of Scripture where it says, and if they could, they would have bitten me with their teeth. It was a very tense situation. But I remember in the middle of it, even though all of that was going on and I had never experienced anything like it before and haven't experienced anything like it since, there was a complete and direct sense of the power of God in that moment, in that hostile environment. And boy... I thank God for the opportunity. Now, I say all that to introduce the text. Actually, there's two texts that we're going to look at tonight. One is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses uh, 4 and 5. If you have your Bible open, look to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. As a matter of fact, um, you can look at verse 3 as well. It also helps with the context of the passage because Paul is contrasting something about the flesh. 
He's talking about flesh, not the fallen part of us that has a tendency to lean towards sin. No, he's talking about flesh and blood. He's talking about who we are physically. In verse 3, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, even though we have flesh and blood, we're made up of skin and bones and all of the above. We do not war after the flesh. Our battle is not with other people. And then here's the verse upon the screen that you see, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are not weapons that you can touch. You can't pick up the sword. There's not some kind of special gun in spiritual warfare. No, these weapons that we use in spiritual warfare, Paul is saying, are spiritual. They are, listen, mighty, effective through God to the what? Pulling down the strongholds, verse 5, casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of God. Of Christ. Paul understood something about spiritual warfare. He would even give us more information in Ephesians chapter 6. And I find it very interesting that when you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, go ahead and turn there, Paul is actually writing from the city of Ephesus. The city of Ephesus, a place that's a pagan stronghold. People have wondered, was the Apostle Paul thinking of Ephesus when he talks about the weapons of the warfare being able to pull down certain strongholds? And maybe he was because the strongholds at Ephesus were mighty. We're going to look at this in just a moment. But here's what I want to do. I want to walk through what Paul is going to say here in verses 8 and 9 of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Put it in somewhat of a context and then give us a sense of what Paul is trying to demonstrate to us. So look at the verse with me. Remember, Paul is writing from the city of Ephesus. Of Ephesus, He's writing to the church at Corinth and he says, But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. I'm going to stay here for a little while longer for a great... Now here it is. Notice what he says. A great door. That's an interesting metaphor, isn't it? An interesting analogy. A great door and effectual, an effectual door, is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. I want you to notice something about this text. Four things that I want to draw our attention to here tonight, and then we're going to enter through this text into a word of prayer over our national convention convening starting this coming up Sunday. Number one, I want you to notice how Paul is going to talk about things in their superlative nature. He's going to talk about things not just in an ordinary way, but it seems like he's trying to communicate the intensity of the moment. I want you to notice, first of all, that Paul has a heavy burden. Now, you you get this from the verses preceding uh, verses 8 and 9. Look back at your text in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Paul has a strong desire. He is longing to be with the people of God. And let me just say this, my goodness. Man, all we have, shouldn't we have a desire to want to be with God's people? Man, I'm just going to tell you, there is something about being around God's people, doing ministry with God's people that just lifts up the soul. Me and Gina had the opportunity uh, yesterday. We went out and made church visits to some of our shut-ins, and we just had a chance to minister and love on them. And I told Gina after we got finished, isn't it just something exciting about being with God's people, loving on them, supporting them, helping to carry the their burdens. That's the way it should be. And that's the way the Apostle Paul feels about believers everywhere. He felt that especially about the church at Philippi that we looked at this morning. And he felt that way about the church at Corinth. Matter of fact, Paul is going to talk to them about an upcoming visit. Look with me in verse 7. I'm sorry, look at verse 5. Now I will come unto you, he's speaking to the church at Corinth, when I shall pass through Macedonia, uh, for I do pass through Macedonia, and I will be, and it will be, I'm sorry, and it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. Let me explain what's going on. 
Paul has a burden to go and to be with the church at Corinth. He knows there are spiritual needs, but more importantly, he knows that there are Christians and brothers and sisters in Christ that he absolutely loves, and he wants to commune and to be with them, and he wants to connect with them strategically in ministry. And this is the missionary model. It's the idea of going and sharing and putting your burden before people and see how God connects the dots. That's why we do it in our church. That's why the missions conference is so important important to me and to you. That's why throughout the year we'll occasionally have missionaries come in. Why? We want to hear what God has put upon their heart to see if God is putting it upon our heart to see if we can connect in ministry and certainly through prayer but many times also through financial support. This is the work of the kingdom and Paul is engaging in this to a degree the city and the church of Corinth. He's saying listen I want to come to you and I want to get together and see how you can possibly support me as I can Continue traveling through Macedonia and doing the kingdom work. Paul has a burden, listen, to be with the church at Corinth. But notice, our text says, he tells them in chapter 16, but I'm going to wait for a while. <laughs> Even though I have this tremendous burden to be with you, to help you, to connect with you, I love you, you are my people. He says, I've got a, a, a burden to be with you, but I'm not going to. I'm going to wait for a while. And I asked you the question, why, with Paul having such a burden for Corinth, what would keep him from going there? He just spent three or four verses talking about his desire to go and to be with them. But he says, no, I'm going to stay in Ephesus. What could be the reason why? Well, I think the answer is pretty simple. He had also a heavy burden for Ephesus. If you were to travel to Ephesus in Paul's day, you'd understand it. You talk about a wicked city. Let me give you some uh, stories from the book of Acts, I think that you'll remember. I think it's Acts chapter 12. I should have looked it up, I'm pretty sure. Acts chapter 12. The Apostle Paul uh, is, is, is aware of the wickedness of the city of Ephesus, and to be sure, it's on display. As a matter of fact, demonic possession is common in the city of Ephesus. History tells us about several oracles that were there. What were oracles? There were those that would go into a demonic trance and they would tell the future and people would come and gather and they were hanging on their every word, demonic activity. Ephesus was a place where uh, the seven sons of Sceva attempted to cast out a demon from a demon-possessed man, and they were not believers. They were not empowered by God. They were not like the Apostle Paul. And what did that demon speaking through that man say? Well, he said, well, listen, man, I, I, I know Jesus Christ, and I know Paul, but I don't know you. And he lit into them, and the Bible says that he was beaten. He beat those seven sons of Sceva, and they fled the house, bruised and naked. He ripped the clothes off of them and beat them silly. The Bible says in the city of Ephesus, suddenly fear came upon the people, and what happened? Many people came, and they brought their books of magic. What? And if you read the text, believers were bringing their books of incantations and magic. This city was so wicked that even those believers that were saved out of the paganism, out of the worship of Diana, of Art Artemis, you've got all these people, well, they were, they were struggling with letting go of their old ways and they too were still hanging on to these books of magic and spells and potions. It was known commonly that it was a city where they would wear amulets that would have special potions and even little written incantations upon them that were demonic in nature. Paul knew something about the city of Ephesus. It was extremely dark and it was extremely pagan. And Paul said, I've got to stay. Oh, I would love to come and fellowship and connect to you, but oh, there's something going on here in the city of Ephesus that needs my attention. And then he begins to explain that. Notice he uses a key phrase. He says, for there is an open door. Effectual. It's there in chapter 16, verse 9, for a great door and effectual is opened 
unto me. Paul has a great burden for the city. Paul has been praying. Paul has been fasting. Others have been praying. Others have been fasting for the gospel to have a foothold in that city for God to do something powerful among the people at Ephesus. And Paul says, wait a second, guys. I would love to come to see you in the city of Corinth, but I'm telling you, God is doing something special. And he uses this very unique phrase. He says there's an open door. Now what you don't see about that word is that it has a nuanced meaning. He's not saying that there's a, a door that is opening. That's not the tense. He's not saying that there's a door that is cracked and I kind of see an opportunity here. No, the idea that Paul is using here when he says an open door, it is flung wide open. And he gives us a sense of how this has occurred when he uses the word effectual. Someone has opened the door. Who is that someone? God has flung that door wide open. And by using the word effectual, Paul is speaking about the power of God. The word effectual has the idea of energy. Now, please hear me what Paul is saying. Now, listen, you've got to get a hold of this. Paul is saying, I want to come to Corinth, but I can't right now. We've been praying for years for God to do something special in this pagan city of Ephesus. And through his walk with the Lord and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in Paul's life, suddenly Paul is seeing God move in extraordinary ways. He's saying, by the hand of God, by the power of God, the opportunity for the gospel has opened up broadly. The door is wide open. And Paul is excited. Let me ask you something. Do you seek to walk with the Lord in such a way like the Apostle Paul did that you have an understanding, God, open up my eyes to what you're doing in the lives of the people around me? God, open up my heart to understand what you're doing, God, because I want to be involved in your kingdom work. And God, I want to be someone that's sensitive to what you're doing. And it's like Henry Blackaby said, Henry Blackaby said, God is always at work around us. What we have to do is to pray in such a way and be on our knees and connected to God that simply we know how to just join in what God is already doing. And Paul in spiritual maturity and insight and guidance by the Holy Spirit, he is able to see and understand that a door has been flung wide open for the gospel by the mighty hand and the power of God. And Paul said, Church of Corinth, I'd like to come, but listen, God is doing something special. And here's what Paul understood about it. I told you these words that Paul uses are words of abundance. They seem to be describing something in a dramatic kind of way because he's talking about a powerful movement of God. And he understands something about personal responsibility. Because look back in the verse. Look at verse 9. We're not done with it, right? For a great door and effectual is open. Two words. Unto me. Those of the... Bible scholars that know the original language a whole lot better than your preacher does. They say that this word, this expression unto me is Paul saying uniquely unto me. Paul is understanding that he is at the right place. He's the right person. And the right time by God's providential and sovereign hand for there to be a work of the gospel that he cannot leave behind. No matter how much affection and desire and burden he has for the people and the church at Corinth, he says, I've got to stay. Oh, my church, there's so much here. I don't know exactly why the Apostle Paul felt that this burden was so uniquely a part of who he was in God's kingdom work plan. Maybe it's because of what he wrote to us in Ephesians chapter 6. Maybe it's because of what he wrote to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 
Remember, Paul is the one who gives us insight into spiritual conflict and spiritual battles. And there's a part of the text here that gives us a sense that Paul knows something is happening in the spiritual realm. Look at me, look at, me, look at verse 9. Look at the very end of it. After talking about that very personal responsibility, Paul says, listen, there's diabolical opposition. He uses a phrase, there are not just adversaries. Remember, Paul uses in this text these words that are adjectives, these words that are ascribing abundance, an open door, an effectual door. He's talking about a unique opportunity. He's talking about the power of God that has blown the door wide open. He's giving a vivid description at the very end. He says, there's not just adversaries, there are many adversaries. We don't know what Paul had in mind. Not exactly. But we do know that Paul had an understanding of spiritual conflict and the unseen realm. I believe God had given Paul special insight so that he could share it to us. And now, centuries later, we are benefiting from it. Remember, Paul would even take this and really give us a sense of it in more detail in Ephesians chapter 6. We wrestle not principalities and powers, right? He understood, we wrestle with principalities and powers and mights and dominions. He talks about our battle is against spiritual forces, wickedness in high places. You know what I would like to suggest to you here tonight, and I can't prove it for sure, but what I think Paul understood was he had spent enough time in the city of Ephesus. He had examined the spiritual nature of that city. He knew the spiritual stronghold so full of witchcraft and sorcery that Paul knew good and well that if God had flung open this door of opportunity for the gospel and kingdom work, that at the very same moment, Satan had also upped his game. And the opposition was going to come in waves, and he was already experiencing and knowing it. The adversaries are here, and Paul would say they are many. So let's put this in two applications. One, in our own lives. Each of us have a unique opportunity. Paul would talk about in Romans chapter 1, he would use the word off horizo. He's talking about the ministry of the gospel that God had given him. And it was a special word. Now listen, it had a nautical expression off horizo. As a matter of fact, you hear the word horizon. Here's what would happen. In, in the nautical terms, you understand that a man could stand high upon the bow of a boat or a ship. Or even you can imagine him climbing the mast and being able to see far into the distance. And off Arezzo, listen, was the area that he could see. He could go 360 degrees and he could see an area. Everything that he could see is that word off Arezzo. You know how I picture this? I'm such a redneck. I remember whenever my grandmother and even my mother would make biscuits, homemade biscuits, right? You would take it and you would roll it out. And you know how it is. They sprinkle a little bit more flour. You ladies know what I'm talking about. And then they would take, and my mother would do this. She would take an old can. Maybe it was an old green beans can. And it was emptied out and it was clean. And she would take it and she would use the round circle to cut into that dough a perfect circle. And then she would do another. And then she would do another. And ladies, what do you do? After you've cut out several of those and you've put them into that baking pan or that iron skillet, you bring the dough back together, what's left over, and you roll it out again. You try to get one or two more out. What Paul was saying in Romans chapter 1 is that each one of us have a circle of ministry. That from where we are in our lives, in the spiritual sense, we can look around 360 degrees where God has placed us, and that is our circle of ministry. You know when Paul said, it has opened unto me, uniquely unto me, Paul was in one way understanding that's all of us. This was his opportunity. God had placed him right time, right place, right person in the city of Ephesus. When God was doing something spiritual, all a spiritual significance, all of those prayers and all that time of fasting leading up to that moment was moving things in the spiritual realm, and Paul was right in the middle of it. It's similar to what we talk about 
with Hadassah, with Esther, for such a time as this. Do you carry that sense of significance about your life? God has placed you with a horizon. Look around, 360 degrees, your life. He knows you. He knows your gift. He knows your ability. He knows your surrounding. He knows your influence. And God has said, I have a unique unto me opportunity. And there will always be opposition. Always. For as much as God wants to work through you, Satan wants to destroy you. And so the application is here over and over again personally. But here's what I want to do tonight. I really felt led when thinking about praying for the National Convention to use this passage as a springboard for our specific prayers for our National Convention. So we're going to enter into a time now where I'm going to ask you to consider some things with this passage in mind, how we want to specifically pray for this National Convention meeting that's coming up next Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and, 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 and obviously even events that happened on the Saturday before. How do we want to do that? Well, there's just a couple of things that I've put on the screen that I want you to follow. You see, just as Paul had at Ephesus a unique opportunity for him to be an influence with the gospel, God has placed certain people in a position of speaking and influence during our national convention that I want to specifically pray for. What a privilege it is to preach the gospel anytime. What a privilege it is to stand before God's people and preach and proclaim the word of God anytime. But these men and women have had an opportunity, Christy, to help speak to the young ladies on Sunday morning, uh, to speak into, to communicate, and to share the truth of God's word. And here's what I believe. I believe that they have their authorizo. They've got their opportunity, their 360 degrees, their opportunity in the world that they are in with the experiences that God has allowed them to go through, with their understanding, with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit guiding them to be a great influence. But at the same time, what did Paul say about the open door? What did Paul say about the opportunity uniquely given to him? There are many adversaries. And so we're going to pray specifically for our speakers. And I want you to, to pray in one sense with an eye open because I want us to mention these people by name. I want them to be upon your heart and upon your mind. When we leave the service uh, tonight, I'm going to put these names upon our Facebook page so that you can go back and you can pray for them uh, throughout the week. You can have this specific. So let me go through this. On Sunday morning, our young people, they will have a, a youth surface. And Christy Johnson, former missionary uh, to Spain, now missionary in residence at Welch College, will be speaking along with Caleb Mealing. Sunday night, Tommy Franks. Uh, Tommy has a Winfield connection. As a matter of fact, Tommy is the pastor at Hamilton Free Will Baptist Church. On Sunday night, Tommy will be preaching uh, in the teen service, in the youth service. On Monday night, uh, Chris Edwards, a uh, dear friend of mine, is going to be preaching on Monday night in the youth service. Jeffrey Dean Smith on Tuesday night. And if you didn't know this, on Wednesday night of the National Convention, there is a joint service. What do I mean by that? A combined service. The youth and the adults join together for one large service service. And that night, uh, Fernando Bustamante will be speaking in that special mission service. And so what I would like to do right now is just to stop. I'm going to ask one of you to stand and pray specifically for these people. And then I'll pray and then we'll move to the next section of prayer. But let's remember there will be hundreds, and eventually, as we get into Monday and Tuesday, over a thousand, perhaps, teenagers, young people will be there under the influence of the gospel, opportunity to, to hear and to be influenced by the Word of God and worship. And so, uh, let's be in prayer. God can start something significant for the future of Free Will Baptist in one of these services because our youth, our leaders of tomorrow, even in many parts and many ways of today, will be there and God can do an incredible work. And so I'd like for us just to pray. We're going to pray for the youth services. And I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Don Godsey, 
Uh, Mr. Don, if you don't mind, will you stand and you lead us in prayer? And if you feel led to specifically pray for one of these or all of these, I ask you to do that. You just pray as led by the Holy Spirit. And let's pray for our youth services and our speakers over our youth conference. Brother Don. Yes. 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 Yes, Lord. Amen. For Christy Johnson, Caleb Millie, Tommy Franks, Chris Edwards, Jeffrey Dean Smith, Fernando Bustamante, Father, we lift them up specifically in prayer, Lord, and I, I come alongside and, uh, Lord, my prayer, the prayers of my brother, and ask you, Lord, that you will bless these men and Christy, Lord, as they prepare their hearts. I know, God, that you have given them the words to say. I know, God, that they have been on their knees in prayer. I know that there are people that are praying across the state of Alabama and, yea, for will Baptists all over this nation that are praying for our youth and the services that we'll have. And I ask your God for a special outpouring of your Holy Spirit, Lord. And may there just be a sense of your presence moving in the hearts of the lives of our young people. And God, I just ask, Lord, for a restraint. I pray, God, that you will uh, restrain the work of the adversary, that you'll uh, constrain him, Lord, and keep him from being able, uh, Lord, to be of such an influence. Lord, may there be a uh, few distractions, Lord, no distractions. May there be a singular focus upon the Word of God, and may your Spirit fill the place each time the Word of God is presented. And Lord, may we see young people, Lord, moved for the sake of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Simultaneously, while the youth are meeting uh, on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, and Tuesday night, the adults will be meeting in the main worship hall area. And we will have our own set of speakers in the adult service on Sunday morning. Uh, Chris Todd uh, will be speaking on Sunday night. Do you know that name? Tim Baumgarten will be uh, speaking. And that name is so familiar to us. As a matter of fact, when I went and typed this up, I put Ken Baumgarten as preaching. And so I had to go back. Oh, wait a second. That's not Ken. That's Tim. And so uh, we're going to be in prayer for Brother Tim Baumgarten tonight as he preaches on Sunday night. Monday night, Brother Jim McComas will be speaking. Uh, those of you that were at the God Man Conference in Northport had a chance to hear uh, Brother Jim McComas, a powerful preacher. Of God's Word, and so we want to be in prayer for Jim McComas on Tuesday night. Kent Barwick will be preaching, and then once again, I uh, mentioned earlier that on Wednesday night it's a combined joint service of the youth and the adults, and Fernando Bustamante will be preaching. And oh, what a service that is! Listen, let me just go ahead and tell you when our missionaries walk in, when the flags of the nations are presented, and our missionaries are walking up on stage and we're seeing what God is doing through Fruitville Baptists across the world. It is a moving time. Moving time. And oh, I'd love for you to be a part of it. And we're going to pray that God will bless that service and bless all of the services at the National Convention, asking God to move on the hearts. And, and once again, I don't pray with your eyes open. God understands. You mentioned these people in prayer. Let's ask God to do a mighty work and ask God to move in a powerful way uh, with these men that we'll be speaking. In, in the leading of that prayer, I'm going to ask Brother Fred Jones if he will stand and lead us in that prayer. And once again, I'll say a word of prayer afterwards. But let's be in prayer for our adult services and our speakers. Brother Fred.
Yes. Father God, once again, we come to you on behalf of the speakers, of the services, and Lord, we're thankful for how you are calling people. Thank you, Lord, that you call men to preach the gospel. Lord, call men to be pastors, to be evangelists, Lord, that you uh, give us a, a sense of who they are and their integrity and their character and what they should be like. And Lord, we're thankful that when we look at this list of men, we're thankful for those who have given their life to the ministry of the gospel, Lord. And we don't understand all of your ways, but Lord, we are thankful, Lord, that you have chosen the simplicity of preaching, Lord, to confound the wise. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the simple preaching of the gospel message, Lord, that builds the kingdom, Lord. And Lord, we're thankful that these men have given their lives, they've answered the call that you have given these men to preach the gospel. Lord, and I pray, God, that you will empower them and that you'll move them. Lord, uh, we believe, Lord, in a, in, a, in a filling of the Holy Spirit. We ask your God for a special filling of the Holy Spirit in their life, Lord, as they are praying, as they are committing themselves to the Word of God, that they'll have an understanding of what you would want them to say and even how to say it, Lord. And once again, we pray for a special movement of your Holy Spirit, Lord, to be upon that place, Lord. And God, we ask that you will just touch hearts and Lord, that you'll move in lives in a real and unique and powerful way. Lord, we pray for that special Sunday night, Lord, the time of uh, feet washing, the, the act of humbly serving each other, Lord. And we pray, God, that you'll bless it and the communion time. And we ask your God that you will just do something wonderful and special, Lord, in our midst. And so, God, once again, we thank you for the opportunity to be under the ministry of the Word of God and the movement of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And, Lord, we ask your Lord that you will work and move. And, Lord, we add to that prayer for the musicians and the singers, Lord. We ask God for, Lord, a power to be upon the choir, Lord, upon those that will help us, Lord, uh, as the great singers did in the Old Testament, as, Lord, as they were sent even before, uh, Lord, the armies, Lord, to proclaim your goodness, Lord, and your praise. And, oh, God, may they go before us, Lord, and may we join them in the chorus of praise, Lord, preparing our hearts for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. And so, Lord, do a work in our hearts. Do a work in their hearts. So, Lord, may we sense, Lord, your spirit moving. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, there was a part there in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 I was hoping to draw your attention to. It was the idea of the effectual door. You know, how Paul is using that word effectual, he's talking about power. A powerful movement of God. A powerful movement of God and flinging open that door. A powerful movement of God with the effectiveness of the gospel. A powerful movement of God with the effectiveness of the ministry of Paul and the word of God. And so that's what we're going to be praying over the National Convention. We've already mentioned how the young people will be gathered in their service. And we've mentioned how the adults will be gathered in their service. And we prayed for the speakers. And now what I'm going to ask you to do is pray for the attendees. There will be those that will come, and some will be very discouraged, I promise you. For some pastors, this is the only time they have a chance to, to get, a, get away and experience the, the fellowship of other pastors and their wives and to be lifted up and encouraged, and I've seen it. I've seen pastors come in weary and, and struggling and see them at the altar and friends gather around them and you hear uh, the prayers and the cries. Uh, there'll be young people searching for identity, trying to find their place even in the kingdom of God and what God wants them to do. And they're finding their own battles. They're living in a culture and a world that continues to further uh, disregard the gospel, even scorn those that believe in the truth of Jesus Christ. Our kids in our own community experience this. And so there will be young people there that will need a word of encouragement. There will be missionaries <laughs> that when we have an opportunity to, to honor the work of God through our missionaries, they will be encouraged because they need that encouragement. And so what we're going to pray for is that power of God, that movement of God, the power of encouragement. Also, we're going to pray for the power of conviction. Amen? Hey, when the word of God is preached, we need to be convicted of sin. 
Uh, we need to be convicted if, if we have strayed away from the path of God. We need to be challenged in certain kind of ways. There's times where we grow cold. There's times when we have not listened to the voice of God. There's times where we, for whatever reason, have not done what God has asked us to do. And Listen, I believe in preaching that convicts. And so we're going to pray for the power of conviction, Lord, for there to be a movement of the Lord in the youth services. If there's young people uh, that are struggling with sin, hiding sin, harboring sin, for the power of conviction upon their hearts and lives and the adults as well, a movement of God and a power of renewal. This is very much like encouragement. But I, I think renewal for me, it goes beyond just personal encouragement to a sense of renewed vision, renewed hope. Renewed vigor, renewed strength where pastors and missionaries and lay people, uh, they can leave our national convention with a sense of, you know what, God is working in the world today and he is working through Fruitville Baptist. And I'm praying for that and I pray that God will do that. And so here's what I would, I would like to do. I want us to have a word of prayer in this regard. And after uh, that prayer, I'll, I'll kind of close this time of prayer, that time of prayer in particular in this area, and then we're going to go to one more. But I would like to ask Brother Danny, if he doesn't mind, to pray for this effectual door, this power of God, to God to fling it open and there just be the power of God displayed in encouragement, conviction, and renewal as we pray tonight. Brother Danny, will you lead us in that prayer? Yes. 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 
Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. And once again, Father, we come to you asking you that you will pour out your power. Lord, may there be a movement that in the generations ahead, we will point back to these few days in July of 2022 in the city of Birmingham where you did something, Lord, that cannot be explained. That you moved and operated in the hearts of the speakers, Lord, and in the hearts of those that were listening. And God, how you called out missionaries to the field. You called uh, young people to the work of the ministry. God, how you encouraged, how you ignited, how you moved in a very significant way. May we look back at this series of services and this national convention as a seminal moment, Lord, in our movement, God, in a revival, Lord. We ask that you do it, Lord. We ask your God. We think about uh, this word effectual, Lord, once again used, Lord, by, by the brother of Jesus, James. He said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, Lord. And so, Father, we are coming before you right now, Lord, asking for you to do something significant, Lord, a movement of encouragement, conviction, renewal, calling, and, and, and salvation, Lord, in our midst. Thank you once again, Lord, Lord, for this opportunity to pray to see your hand moving in Jesus' name. Amen. The final phase of our prayer time goes back to that statement where Paul talked about there being many adversaries. And so what I would like to do, and Brother Danny already mentioned it in his prayer, uh, praying for spiritual protection against satanic distraction. Uh, I do know this, that for months there has been planning. Uh, Lord, the National Convention is something that is planned and planned and planned, thought about and prayed over. There have been many meetings. Brother Danny has been a part of so many meetings about this. Organization, planning. Uh, there are, are churches right now in the state of Alabama that we have designated this Sunday, the 17th, as a day of prayer, a Sunday of prayer. And so there's a lot going on on our side. In other words, on those that are those that are organizing and trying to, to pray and move in a spiritual sense and helping, uh, asking God to help us and to move in our midst. But I will say this. We're doing all of that and Satan's doing it too. Paul very specifically said in Ephesians chapter 6, 
We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and minds and dominions. And you see a sense of structure there in the spiritual realm. There's organization. I'm telling you, the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And there is a strategy and there's a sense. And there is spiritual opposition that's already organized against this national convention. I promise you, it's happened. Satan's at work. But what we have is a weapon. It's interesting, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul gives the sense of this spiritual battle, and then he says, pray, and pray, and pray, praying always, praying. Uh, this was something that's alluded to, of course, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the weapons of our warfare. What are they? They're prayer, they're fasting. What are the weapons of our warfare? The word of God, the authority that's found in the name of Jesus. Jesus himself. And so what we need to do is to understand that. And we need to have a time, I believe, of praying for spiritual protection against satanic distractions, against skeptical and critical hearts. There's nothing that quenches the work of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it seems as quickly as those who are just negative in spirit, negative in heart, critical spirits, critical hearts. There will be spiritual opposition. And so what we're going to ask, and by the way, we have actually seen physical opposition at national conventions before, people picketing outside against what Frugal Baptists stand for. Yeah. So we need to pray. We need to pray. I'm going to ask Brother Charles, if you don't mind, Brother Charles, will you stand and lead us in this prayer of spiritual protection over our national convention, our services, our leaders, and uh, what we want God to do is just put a hedge of protection around it. If you don't mind, Brother Charles, will you stand and lead us in that prayer, and then I'll close us in that prayer. with his authority over uh, sickness and over the demonic spiritual realm. In Acts chapter 2, Peter and John are entering into the temple. Silver and gold have I none, were their declaration, but such as I have given to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the rise and walk, in his authority and in his name. When asked by that council, the group of leaders and elders and high priests that examined Peter and John over what had occurred. Whose name do you do this in? Whose name are you proclaiming? And they said without hesitation, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 
And so, Father, Lord, we know there's something special about that name because that name represents the authority. Ephesians chapter 1 reminds us that you have placed Jesus Christ far above all principalities and mights and powers and dominions. And you have given him to be the head of the church. So not only is he above all spiritual darkness, not only is he above all that which is unclean and unrighteous, Lord, he is the head of the church. And what we're going to do in assembling for these next few days on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday in the city of Birmingham as we are coming with the purposes of building the kingdom. And thank you, Lord, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And so, Father, we ask for that spiritual protection. Lord, when the adversary comes with his intimidation and his fear tactics, help us to understand greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And may it be like it was for Elijah's servant Gehazi when he feared the opposition. Elijah simply prayed, O God, open up his eyes. And suddenly Gehazi saw the angel armies that were there, the spiritual realm. We saw, we see, Lord, that that they are there even though they are unseen. And Lord, they are there in the battle, in the fight, and they are commissioned by God and sent by God. And so, Father, we pray, Lord, for that spiritual protection, that help, that empowerment. And we ask, Lord, this in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and his authority, we ask your God that you will protect. Lord, we ask your God that you will empower. We ask your God for a mighty movement Lord, in our midst. And so, Lord, thank you once again, Lord, for your protection and your might. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. There is an open door. And let's continue to pray uh, that God will bless the, the planning, the organization of our national convention. I do ask you to continue, especially to be in prayer for Brother Danny and Miss Karen, as they have such a vital role in the state of Alabama's part in this. And so much is upon his shoulders and Miss Karen's shoulders. And we ask that you will be in prayer uh, for them. Dick and Barb will be uh, going up and uh, being part of the representation, I think, of the children's home. And uh, so let's be in prayer uh, for them as well. Our praise team will be going up and being a part of a seminar, a demonstration on, on Monday. Uh, they'll be doing that at 1 o'clock on Monday. Uh, my family will also be going up. We'll be here on Sunday morning and Sunday night. We'll still be here at our church. We're going to drive up on Monday and uh, start our participation in the Nationals that Monday morning. And you be in prayer for our praise team and my family as they go up. And be in prayer uh, for others that uh, will possibly be going up and participating. Let's just ask the Lord for safety travel and just a time of sense of family and community as we go up and be a part of the meetings. All righty. Very good. Been a special night tonight. Thank you so much for being part of it. Let's stand and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. We still do plan on going up on Saturday for the Impact Birmingham. Uh, we'll have a group that will be uh, leaving here at 7.30 a.m. We'll be heading up to Birmingham. Uh, one of our own in the state of Alabama, Joel Franks, is heading up uh, the Impact Ministries from the state of Alabama side of it. And so uh, we're going to be carrying our bundles of socks up there, and we're going to be putting those care packages together. There'll be others that will be distributing those. There'll be those that will be doing other kinds of projects. If you would like to go in part, be a part of that. Uh, you can be here at 730, or you can just head on up there. If you want to be a part of that, see me. You can actually go into uh, nafwb.org and get information. Uh, I've already put the links up on our social media. I'll put them up there again so you can go to those and see those if you so need to. All righty. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Brother Donnie Franks, will you dismiss us in the word of prayer tonight? Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Trouble, trouble, trouble.